Uh, I would like to just acknowledge the uh, assistance of the Refugee Rights Action Network people who are here tonight. I'm just going to make a few comments at the end. Uh, they've got a couple of events coming up and they've been very helpful in publicising tonight's event, as have Carrie, uh, the other, one of the other refugee groups in Perth. So thanks both those groups. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out and, and listening to Tony. Uh, the plan for tonight is I'll, I'll just make a few general comments. Uh, then Kay Bernard, who many of you will know, uh, will make a few comments and officially launch the book. And then uh, we'll hand over to Tony, who will uh, talk about the, the book. Um, the book is on sale, Reluctant Rescuers. Um, it is self-published. Um, Tony worked hard, as did many of us, to find a commercial publisher for the book, um, but that wasn't to be, and so the book is, is self-published. Uh, many of you will know this is Tony's fourth book. Um, the first book was, I think, one of the great books written in Australia in the last decade, uh, Tony's book on Civex, The Citizen of Civex, uh, which won a number of awards. And then he subsequently wrote a book on walking the Camino, which uh, he's done. And then a third book on climate change. Uh, all of which, I think, Tony, were published by Blackie. Is that true? Scribe. Scribe, sorry. By Scribe in Melbourne. And then the fourth book, Reluctant Rescuers, uh, self-published and just recently published. It has been launched in Melbourne and Canberra, with launches to come in. Sydney and Adelaide. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Perth, uh, when we heard the book was launched, um, Tony has funded his, his trip to Perth and uh, is here for a day or two. So, if people want to catch up with Tony or take an opportunity to publicise the book, I'm sure uh, he would welcome that chance. Uh, listen, I just want to make a, a few comments uh, just to put this in some context. Um, Tony's book really, um, it's called Reluctant Rescuers, and Tony will also make mention of the superb artwork on the front by an artist who's here with us tonight, and Tony will talk about Natalie's work. Um, I guess Tony's book really picks up issues around the human rights of asylum seekers and the need for Australia and the Australian government to be concerned about 800 people whose lives have been lost in that 200 to 300 mile uh, crossing from Indonesia to Christmas Island. Um, some of you will know that Tony was a diplomat, probably still is, but not officially, he's <laughs> left the, dip, the diplomatic service. Um, Tony was an ambassador in, in Poland and in Cambodia. Um, and there's a, a Polish poet who wrote some words that relate very much to what Tony's work in this book is about. I can't say his name. How do you say Tony? Zbigniew. Zbigniew Herbert, um, who wrote a poem, and in, he wrote these words. How hard to establish the names of all those who were lost, battling against inhuman power. Observers from the sidelines give dubious figures equipped with the disgraceful word approximately. But in these matters, accuracy is necessary. One can't get it wrong even in a single case. In spite of everything, we are our brother's keepers. Ignorance about those who are lost undermines the reality of the world. And I think Tony's work, both in his earlier book, Civ X, and in this book, tries to bring into the consciousness of our nation the 800 people who've been lost trying to cross from Indonesia to Australia. And what Tony's book does is ask some fundamental questions about Australia's border protection system and our maritime rescue system at sea. 
one of the questions he asks in the book and he'll talk about is what does it mean for the people on the front line who have to operate within a system with confused and contradictory values. He also asks in this book if government policy is based on lies and misuse of statistics and truths, what does it mean for us as citizens? And how do governments normalise and justify the unthinkable, the loss of 800 people's lives? Um, many of you will be aware that since Tony sent his book to the publishers, uh, new information has emerged on both the boat that sank uh, on Christmas Island in December 2011, and there have been a number of recent uh, sinkings and, and loss of lives and rescues. And the, the hypotheses that Tony puts forward in this book is, I guess, again, demonstrated by those particular events. And Tony will talk about those events tonight. Um, Tony will also talk tonight about the fact that whilst this book is about Australia's maritime protection system and our rescue at sea system. It is fundamentally about the larger debate about the rights of asylum seekers and the responsibility of Australian governments for the safety of people, not just when they arrive in Australia, but on their way to Australia. And um, Tony will, will talk about those, uh, those matters tonight. Um, I'll hand over to Kay Bernard. Many of you will know Kay, some of you may not. Um, Kay um, has personal experience of the matters that are in Tony's book. Um, Kay's been a long time refugee, West Australian refugee campaigner and activist since the dark days of the Howard years that many of you here will, uh, will have been uh, involved in. Um, Kay worked on Christmas Island at the time of a number of the incidents that are described in Tony's book. Uh, she was the General Secretary of the Christmas Island Workers Union. Um, and how long were you there, Kay, on Christmas? I was up on Christmas for about 18 months. So Kay was on Christmas for 18 months during the time that many of the events that Tony describes happened. Um, and Kay uh, has personal experience and personal relationships with people who were directly affected by the events that Tony describes. So I'll hand over to Kay, who's going to make a few comments and then officially launch Tony's book. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight to um, launch Tony's book and another important record of um, parts of our history um, as citizens that um, would otherwise have gone unrecorded and I think um, without the people that stick their neck out on the line I'm like Tony to um, use his information and knowledge accumulated over, over years as working um, within the government sector to analyse the information that's come out um, um, without his brave um, uh, self-publishing of this book and his previous book, um, the, the records of wrong um, would go unnoticed and, 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 and all be to you for doing it, Tony. You know, I know you've made personal sacrifices with your family for that. Just as an aside, I got involved in refugee advocacy through a um, family member who um, convinced me um, that it was very important that I get involved with a, um, a boatload of refugees that turned up just off Port Hedland in 2003. Um, unfortunately for Philip Ruddick, he said that they were outside of the 12 nautical mile, that boat of Vietnamese, um, had photos of them taken almost crashing into the reef at a high tide just um, outside the Port Hedland Detention Centre. So, you know, you, you're pretty on the money when you start talking about people trying to weasel word and describe the location of boats when citizens of Australia are taking photos of them and thinking about getting their dinghy and going getting. They weren't outside the 12 nautical mile limit, you know. It's when um, people can see, Australians can see exactly what's going on and that's what happened with the Jenga and the horrific images that were reported in 2010, December 
2010 that um, Tony obviously has um, been compelled to write his second book. I remember standing on the um, up near Taijin House, which is on the high point overlooking Flying Fish Cove, where many people be unloaded when they come in seeking asylum to Australia. Um, at the first um, anniversary of the Civics Memorial that the locals on Christmas Island had put together. And I read a passage out of Tony's first book, Civics, at that first ever memorial, which still is still in place on Christmas Island. And um, it seems quite unfortunate that um, 800 people have lost their lives subsequent to and, and including the civics, it's my understanding. Christmas Island is a strange and far away place. Um, we've got journalists here tonight that can vouch for that, but what goes on on Christmas Island um, is quite ad hoc. It can be quite um, um, relaxed, it can be very intense, and for people that arrive seeking asylum in Australia, they have they arrive with a great hope that we are a civilised, compassionate nation. That's why they come here. People will portray that it's for the dollars, it's for Centrelink, it's for you know, anything they can milk out of the country, but the reality of the situation is that they believe that this country have ethics, compassion, we are signatories to the Refugee Convention, convention and that is why they come here. When they step off that boat, there's a small metal step on the side of the jetty that when the barge comes up, they step onto that and they think that they're stepping onto people who are not corrupt, people that would do the right thing, people that would respect their human rights. Unfortunately, unbeknown to them, during their journey to our country, there are many forces at work to deter them from coming. And I believe part of that deterrence is captured in Tony's book. And he's done a marvellous job of that in as much as he's uncovered and dissected information that goes toward how can these boats not be detected? How can to not be detected? When I glance down at chapter six of Tony's books, it's about what I call the Jenga. That's a um, departmental, diet departmental name for the 221 that sang. <coughs> the people that survived the Janga can only be um, described as a miracle. The people that stood on the shore of Christmas Island and watched the crash of the Janga have that etched in their mind forever. There are people on Christmas Island who are never going to be the same because of it. But the people that our government collected, or I'll, I'll retract that, the people that survived from the Jenga have told me from the moment I met them when they were squirrelled away in the Christmas Island Detention Centre, it is without the everyday people on Christmas Island that they would not have lived, including the young boy Cena, who um, was one of the first survivors that I met on Christmas Island as, while I was visiting um, the Christmas Island Detention Centre. I held a bit of hope that with this government, who um, back in 2003 said that it was bloody ridiculous to take boat people from the shores of Port Hedland with an operating detention centre up to Christmas Island, have taken in excess of 300 boats while in power exactly the same way at great cost to this country. It was when, that, when I came across the little boy, Cena, who had been in the water from the Jenga, the 221, and um, had been squirrelled away, and held apart from his auntie and uncle while his own mum and dad had, dad had drowned, until she agreed to tell him that his own mum and dad had drowned. That is, the, the department said to her, We're not, your, your, your nephew has survived, but you can't see him until you tell him that his mother and father have died. That's how they cut deals. So with that type of compassion, the people that step off the boats thinking that we are a compassionate, ethical, nice country, we're not. We're not in as much as that's how our, our country is run. And when you go to dissecting the intelligence, as Tony has done in relation to 
boat journeys from Indonesia, the intelligence is there and there is a reluctance to um, <coughs> there is a reluctance to rescue. My own personal experience, and I'll try to cut this short, my own personal experience in um, a reluctant rescue was when an advocate who was on Christmas Island came to me one afternoon in the union office and said, Kay, I had a call this afternoon about 40. This is about five, about 4.30. This is about 5.30. <clears throat> I had a call from a boat in distress. I said, what did you do? She said, I got the telephone number and I gave it to Diet. I said, good, I don't trust Diet. What are we going to do? She said, oh, they said don't call the boat because the, 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 the phone might go flat. They were set phone on the boat. I said, did you get the GPS coordinates? She said, no, I didn't. I said, let's ring them and get the GPS coordinates. Which, it took a few phone calls <coughs> to, est to establish the GPS coordinates. The boat had been contacted by the Navy, but the Navy had never bothered to take the GPS coordinates. Now, there are, there are as Tony identified in his book, systems in place to track the boats. Why wouldn't you, if you weren't a reluctant rescuer, take the GPS coordinates from that boat, because they all have GPS nowadays, wouldn't you take, as a Navy, take the GPS coordinates? The Navy, the guys streaming, the Navy told us they'd be here a few hours ago. Okay? They weren't there. They hadn't made any more contact. They'd made one phone call. Hadn't got the GPS coordinates. So we handed that information on to Diag, the contact of Diag. I went down to my friends to try to work out. There was, two, there was two naval ships on Christmas Island that day and they were parked up in the Flying Fish Cove, okay? There was, um, I went down to my friends to work out how, by about half past six, seven o'clock by now, how long would it take with those coordinates for a boat to get out there at an average time? thinking that those boats would fire up very soon because this boat was in distress and taking water and go out and get those people. When I got to my friends who've got a boat, they've lived on Christmas for a long, long, long time to work out the GPS coordinates, um, she said, bugger it, I don't trust any of them. I'm ringing the local police. And we happened to jag one of the policemen who you would see in one of those photos that was standing on those rocks trying to help the people from the Jenga. He took it really seriously. But wouldn't you think that our authorities would have notified the local police that there's an emergency on the shores of Christmas Island, not far off the shores of Christmas Island, and they would have notified the local hospital in case they got some injured from it. This is back in uh, February this year. So here you've got the, 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 the local police of Christmas Island <coughs> who take it very seriously, and they ran that through to that information, those GPS coordinates, through to AMSA. Then the boats in Flying Fish Cove fired up and steamed out to collect those people. The policeman on Christmas Island that's totally affected by his experience at 221 thought this was the first call in for that boat. It wasn't the first call in. He rang me back two hours later, which is what we'd worked out it would take to get out to that boat that was taken on water said they bought it now, okay, it'll be okay. Thanks, mate. The next day in the Australian newspaper, people were ringing from that boat to Perth, it was reported in that paper, at eight o'clock that morning, which was seven o'clock Christmas Island morning, and yet the two naval ships stuck at anchor in Flying Fish Cove. So, Tony, you're on the ball. The fact of the matter is that we are a reluctant country when we're dealing with asylum seekers, particularly those on boats. Cheers. And good all for coming and I've got a few people particularly to thank tonight which I'll do immediately. I'd like to thank um, Scribe Publications who taught me to have confidence in my writing abilities with my first three books. I don't bear a grudge against them for not publishing this fourth one. I understand their judgment that this might not be a commercial book but uh, they did teach me how to write and they taught me how to have confidence in my writing. I want to thank Mark Hutton, whose wonderful archival website, www.civx.com, is the source of so much of my factual documentation and with whom I work very closely and productively. I want to thank Colin Penter for organising this tonight, and I want to thank the 
a refugee action network from WA Australia, Western Australia for helping to make it possible. Thank you all for coming. The book I've written now, Reluctant Rescuers, is a book that I never thought I would have to write. I, I had hoped, perhaps naively, that the inception of a Labor government in 2007, a government that had pursued assiduously while in opposition the truth of CivEx, would ensure that systems would be put in place that nothing like this could ever happen again. And I do believe that figures like Senator John Faulkner and Kevin Rudd were, were keen that this should, should happen. And one of the things that my book records is that early in his Prime Ministership, Kevin Rudd called for a national security review. He commissioned a Western Australian, Rick Smith, to conduct that review. And part of the review was border security. And, and Rick Smith recommended that the previous rather disorganised relationships between the Defence Force and the Customs Department, nobody ever quite knew who was responsible for what aspect of border security, should be organised and centralised in a new renamed Department of Customs and Border Protection, an enhanced title, which reflected a greatly enhanced role. And that, that the Navy border security system would come under a customs civilian head. So in fact there's a, there's a Navy Admiral, yes. currently Admiral Tim Barrett, who reports to a customs uh, senior official, currently Marion Grant, uh, and that is the structure of command of border security. Would this result in a more humane system? One might have hoped so, but in fact it hasn't. It's resulted in, if anything, a, a tougher more ruthless system. Um, there seems to be a disposition in government, very strongly ingrained, to regard people coming here seeking refuge as essentially a national security threat. I, I find this hard to understand because I'm, my mother was a Jewish refugee from Vienna, and she was certainly no national security threat. But if she'd been in a small boat coming to Australia in recent years, she would have been. And as I looked at the record over the last few years of deaths at sea, I, I found a couple of interesting facts. First of all, nearly all asylum seekers who come in small boats do arrive safely. Something like 26,000 people have come in the last 13 years in over 600 boats. And most of them, 97% of the people and 99% of the boats, have been safely detected and intercepted by Australia's border security system. Now, of course, those people aren't trying to come into Australia clandestinely. They want to be intercepted. They want to be um, taken into custody. They want to have their refugee claims assessed. But the fact of the matter is, and I think it's a tribute to our border protection services, that most of them have arrived safely. Unfortunately, a small number of people have not arrived safely. What do I mean by a small number? I mean something upwards of 500 people over the last three years have drowned or are thought to have drowned in transit to Australia from nearby Indonesia. And there are five major events that have caused these fatalities. First of all, there were two boats that went missing in 2009 and 2010. And there is a strong story to be told about each of those boats, which has been largely unearthed by Natalie O'Brien of the Fairfax Press. Thirdly, there's the disaster that Kay's just referred to, the, the crash of Civ 221 on Christmas Island in December 2010. Fourthly, there's the sinking of the Barocca, a boat that founded about 40 miles offshore from Indonesia on the 15th of December last year and which is believed to have given rise to between 150 and 200 casualties, deaths. Only a few survivors, about less than 50. Now those are the four incidents dealt with in my book. But in fact I didn't know everything that I know now about the Barocca. Important new information has emerged about the Barocca since my book, which I will come back to. And, and fifthly, there's the boat that sank on the 21st of June this year, uh, drowning 90 people. 
which is a, a terrible story that, that validates and confirms the general hypotheses of my book. I'll come back to that at the end of my remarks as well. Let me, let me try and summarize what are my main findings from closely studying the data that's publicly available on those four sinkings. And this is all in the book. Firstly, there's a systematic dehumanization of asylum seekers. They are, they are not regarded as people until we actually put them on shore at Christmas Island. Until then, they're a sort of a dehumanized, abstract national security threat. And this thinking imbues everything, unfortunately. It imbues the sorts of reactions that Kay was just talking about. The, the callousness, the carelessness, the indifference when people send messages of distress. Secondly, there's a systematic propensity to put national security ahead of saving life. And this was absolutely clearly articulated in the evidence given by both the head of Border Security Command, Admiral Tim Barrett, and his civilian supervisor, Marion Grant, to the coroner's investigation, the Western Australian coroner's investigation. They each said, in their own words, two propositions that are remarkably important and remarkably inhumane. Firstly, that we, the border security system, are not responsible for the safety of life at sea of the people whose boats we are trying to protect and intercept. How can you possibly say that we're out there detecting and intercepting boats invading our maritime space and we're not responsible for the safety of life at sea of the people on those boats. This cuts right across centuries of maritime safety of life at sea doctrine. That you are responsible for the safety of people on boats if you observe them to be in trouble. The border security system cuts through that in a logic chopping sort of way saying, I oh, know, that's the job of the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, that's not our job. So you have this bug passing between bureaucratic organisations. And of course, when bureaucratic organisations pass the buck, humanity takes the last place. And with a system where nobody's responsible, where everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. And Colin, my friend Colin Penter, who's a great fan of the sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, knows how bureaucracies can create, can create evil outcomes without individuals being necessarily evil who work in those bureaucracies. And as border security has become so bureaucratized, the risk of evil outcomes being generated is, is very great. And this is certainly clear from my work. Another thing that's come through clearly is the double standard that essentially an asylum seeker who calls for help is less worthy of attention than a yachtsman or a merchant, merchant ship who calls for help. Now, of course, they deny this. They say, no, there's only one standard. We treat all distress calls the same way. But the reality belies that assertion. I forgot to mention the other thing that came out of the coroner's inquiry that was terribly important. The testimony of both Border Protection Command and the Department of Customs and Border Protection was that there is a greater risk if asylum seeker boats reach the coast of Australia than if they reach Christmas Island or Ashmore Reef or Cocos Island, because those island territories have been legislated as outside the Australian migration zone. So we can legally send people who arrive on those three island territories to places like Nauru or Malaysia, whereas we can't so easily do that if they arrive on the coast of Australia. So here's an interesting example of the, the use of the word risk. Most of us in this room would say risk refers to things like the risk of being run over, the risk of being electrocuted, the risk of drowning at sea. But in the bureaucratic language, risk doesn't refer to any of those things. Risk refers simply to the risk of people arriving in Australia from where it's more difficult to send them offshore. And just imagine what this does to people working in the system. Kay's just given you chapter and verse, a clear example of what it does. It leads to that indifference. Oh, look, they're only coming to Christmas Island. What do we care? Does it matter so much? Oh, if they get here, if they don't get here, 
it's not part of Australia anyway for migration purposes. So that that corrupts the whole system, that that misconstruction of risk. And I talk about that in my book. There's another thing that distress at sea is only a reality when it's seen. Um, you actually, in the border protection system doctrine, have to declare a safety of life at sea incident before you can do anything about it. It's, it, it sounds strange and bureaucratic, but that's the truth. Um, a interception only becomes a rescue when it's declared to be a rescue. Once again, this, this creates a mindset that says that if you get a strange distress call over the phone from something out there somewhere, is it real? Does it really exist? Is it a hoax call? I don't know. Is it people trying to get a water taxi to Australia, as Christopher Pine recently said? Is it people trying to call the NRMA? It's not really a distress call, is it? It's just asylum seekers trying to get a rise out of us again. So you get a whole set of attitudes creeping through the system. And, and one of my goals in writing this book is to try and go back. I'm, I'm actually very conservative. I'm not very radical. I'm an old-fashioned conservative. I'm trying to go back to the old idea that when you get a distress call, if somebody knocks at your door and says, hey, I'm being, my, you know, my son is being bashed in the street outside, please help him, you, you go and help. You don't say, is he an asylum seeker? No, you, you actually go and help and ask questions later. And, and that is what our Navy wants to do. Our Navy has got, it's like mother's milk to them. The response to, to distress at sea is to go to the rescue and see what the nature of distress is. And if they're discouraged from doing that by politicians speaking irresponsibly and saying, well, you know, they're probably trying it on, they're probably trying to take advantage of us, it's corrosive of decency in the system. And I'm, I'm trying to defend the decency of the system. My, my father was a naval officer. I've already told you my mother was a Jewish refugee. That's a very combustible combination. I, I combine naval officer and Jewish refugee in my, in my genetic stream. So it's, um, that's probably why I'm so troublesome. Um, the other thing that my book discusses in detail and exposes with chapter and verse of fact is the way in which when these limited number of disasters have occurred, these five disasters in the last three years, when officials are pressed on them, do they tell the truth? No, they don't. They dissemble, they try to vague it all up, they lie, they do their best to make sure that the truth doesn't come out. And in a funny sort of way, this is a tribute to our political system because Senator George Brandis, who emerged as a bit of a, vill a villain in my first CIVX book, he probably saw a bit of a chance to get his own back because he was actually an indefatigable pursuer of truth on what happened with the 2009 lost boat. And he was actually channeling John Faulkner in putting customs officials through very embarrassing interrogations through which step by step they had to step back and step back and step back about a boat that they initially said they knew nothing about in the end, they had to admit we actually knew it would have sent us a distress call and it had sent us coordinates of where it was in distress. So they went from there, we knew nothing about it, to there. We got a distress call, we got the coordinates. And this is where another thing comes, comes out of my book. That most of the time, we do rescue when we get a distress call. And the technology nowadays is such that with people carrying mobile phones when they go into boats, they can send distress calls. And GPS indicates the coordinates of those distress calls, as Kay, as Kay just evidenced to you. So don't, don't think that we don't know every phone call made from an asylum seeker boat. We do, because we're scrutinizing them all the time in terms of violation of our maritime space. So of course we collect signals intelligence. And of course, we also collect police intelligence from onshore before they leave. But let me focus on the signals <coughs> intelligence here. We do know where the boats are when people send distress calls. There's no question of that. And this is, is emerging from the case studies in my book, and it's emerging from the additional information that's come out in the, the few weeks since my book went to print. So my, my task has been, with this book, to try to illuminate how this secret intelligence-based system works in practice. 
and I, I pay tribute and I want to emphasize this to the way in which most of the time it works efficiently and honorably and safely. Most of the time the people coming in these boats, and they are rickety dangerous boats, and they're often overloaded, and they're often underskilled crews. It's amazing how many of them we do rescue. Thank goodness we do, because they're fellow human beings. They're not security threats, they're people who in a few years' time will be driving your taxi or pump, pumping petrol at your gas station. Their kids will be at school with your kids. They are part of the rich multicultural mix of Australia. They're not enemies, they're people seeking refuge. And I've, I've tried to show in my book that we have to separate out our safety of life at sea response from our argument about asylum seeker policy. This is something that's difficult for many people to understand, not just people on the other side of the argument, but the people on what I imagine to be most of your side of the argument. They want me to express views on Nauru or on Malaysia. I have views on those matters, of course, but I choose not to make them part of my public presentation of this book. Because what I'm trying to do in this book is to say, as a decent country, we have to separate out our safety of life at sea response to people who send us dress calls from our politics. We can argue the politics until we're blue in the face about Malaysia or Nauru or internal processing or detention centres or community detention or whatever. They're all important arguments. And I'm not trying to say they're not important. I'm just saying that I don't buy into those arguments publicly because I feel that what I'm on about in its own right is terribly important. Why is it terribly important? It's terribly important because when, when young men and women join our Navy, they join it to defend Australia and they join it to behave decently. They don't join it to take part in some dishonourable, discreditable game of pass for parcel with neighbouring countries. Who's going to be responsible for saving these people's life at sea? I, I can't begin to describe to you how ugly that is. How ugly it is when somebody sends a distress call to the Australian Maritime Safety Authority to be told in response, oh look, you'd better go back to Indonesia, they're closer. Hello, this is totally out of line with the LAW law of rescue at sea. The law of rescue at sea is that the nearest available ship with the resources goes to the rescue. Now, Indonesia does not have ocean-going rescue vessels, nor does Indonesia have the inclination to rescue boats that have left Indonesia for good. They're actually glad to see them gone. And once they've left Indonesia's 12 mile territorial zone, they're in international waters. Now, if the people on that boat then spring a leak, or the engine fails, and they call the Maritime Safety Authority, or they call the Australian Federal Police, and they say, we're in distress, please come and rescue us, we have no alternative as a decent country and as a decent navy but to go and investigate that. Now, it is quite possible that when they see a navy boat arriving on the scene, they may actually make sure that they're in distress. Let me put this, I don't know how delicately I can say it, there is an incentive to be in distress when you see an Australian Navy boat coming. So it's possible that some of these situations are, to an extent, created deliberately. But that's not our job, to make those judgments. We have to leave our commanders at sea, our Navy commanders, to say, is this boat that I see wallowing in the water in the process of sinking, or with irreversible engine failure and with no navigation capacity, are the people on this boat at risk? It's not our Navy's job to say, how did this happen? Did these people create a political uh, situation here? That's not our Navy's job. Our Navy's job in that situation is to rescue and leave it to other people to ask the questions later. If they don't do that, their, their mandate has been corrupted and it has been corrupted by politics. So what I'm trying to do with this book is to remind people within the system, as well as people like yourselves who are challenging the system in all sorts of decent and honourable ways, 
I want to remind people within the system, hey, you guys have a code of conduct, and your code of conduct does not allow you to treat asylum seeker distress calls any differently from distress calls from any other boat. Is this a big subject or a small subject? I've been told recently it's a small subject. I think it's a big subject. I think over 500 deaths at sea that could have been avoided within our available technology and resources is a very big subject. I don't really care that we've received 24,000 people safely and efficiently. I take that as a tribute to the decency and efficiency of the men and women on the front line. But I do care that we've lost 500. If we had a 3% casualty rate on the, Western Aus on, on the Perth train system, None of you would regard that as acceptable. You'd say it should be a 0% casualty rate. Why should a border security system's performance standard be any different? And that leads me to another big lie that keeps emerging in this system, and that is that it's all the people smugglers' fault. These people die because people smugglers send them out in unseaworthy boats. Well, that's true in one sense, but in another sense it's not true, because how is it that 97% of the people have arrived safely. They certainly weren't escorted from Indonesian boundary to Australia. They got here under their own steam. Most of them do get here under their own steam. Sometimes they don't. I think that we have got to try to make sure that there's a 0% fatality rate on asylum seeker boats, just as we try to assure there's a 0% fatality rate in our road system, in our train system, in our plane system, these are all parts of complex systems for moving people around. And once we let politics intrude in them, we, we debase ourselves. So I'm appealing to a wide audience in this book. I'm trying to say to people, think about these issues. I don't want to encourage whistleblowers. I don't think whistleblowing gets you very far, it just destroys careers. But I want to encourage a rediscovery of some traditional values and um, a rediscovery of what our border security people, who are largely Navy, also Air Force, should be thinking when they go about their daily work. So I've just about come to the end of my remarks, but I'll be, I'll be happy to take questions. Mm. Yeah, listen, if there are any questions of Tony on the matters he's discussed tonight or the book, um, yeah, very happy to take them. Yeah, Nick, Nick here. Hi, Tony, Nick here. Uh, um, I do have a question for you. Um, it does appear that there's been an increase in deaths and seas in recent years from the figures you give. Um, do you see the criminalisation of people so-called people smuggling being significant in that factor? And do, I guess that is a political issue, but I'd be curious for your comment on it, because it seems this whole campaign against the so-called um, people smuggling model and driving this, um, this service to refugees underground has resulted in, um, in people travelling in more dangerous conditions perhaps than has been the case in the past. Thank you. We, we do continue, according to Brendan O'Connor, he's quoted in my book, we do continue not only to collect intelligence in Indonesia on people smuggling operations, but also to disrupt, try to disrupt those operations. Now, how we try to disrupt them, as set out by Commissioner Keelty in 2002 in the Senate inquiry into the Circuit Maritime Incident, when he was questioned extensively by John Faulkner and others on, on CIVEX, he said we, we, don't, we wouldn't do anything lawful, uh, uh, we wouldn't do anything unlawful in our disruption activities, and we assume that our Indonesian um, people with whom we work, from the Indonesian police and so on, would not do anything unlawful either. And when he was asked, well, can you be sure of that? He said, no, we, we can't be sure of that. <laughs> now, we continue to conduct disruption operations in Indonesia. I would hope that those operations are entirely lawful, and I would hope that they do not have the effect of increasing the risk to people who get on boats and leave Indonesia. If they do, we've got a problem. Unfortunately, we, just by virtue of
decriminalising the operation of bringing people to Australia and imposing heavy jail sentences on Indonesian crews and boats that come here, destroying boats when they arrive here. We are, simply by those policies, making the journey more dangerous because it means that, number one, they send boats that are um, at the end of their lives that aren't worth very much. Basically, they're a one-way journey. And secondly, they put young boys or old men on the boats who have no particular economic value as crews and who can be left to languish in jail for a couple of years in Australia. So we, I mean, just by virtue of those facts, that the voyages are more dangerous. But I would hope that we do not go that further step of doing anything by way of disruption that makes the voyages more dangerous. <coughs> Questions or comments? Yep. Um, yep. Tony Abbott's um, stated policy of um, sending the boats back, do you feel that this is just pre-election speak, that um, you know, he has no intention of actually doing? Unfortunately, no. It's a good, <laughs> it's a good question. David Ma has expressed views on this. David recently retired. And David believes that Number one, Tony Ma knows that people will die as a result of turning back the boats, and number two, Tony Abbott doesn't care. Um, he's a fairly tough man, Mr Abbott, and he knows that the Navy is desperately worried about turning back the boats. I've got a whole chapter on this in the book. It's a very dangerous and ugly operation, fraught with risk, both for the asylum seekers and for the Navy crews involved. Mm. But Tony Abbott has the view that you join the Navy to defend Australia against whatever the government of the day defines as risks that have to be defended against, and if it's pushing asylum seekers back to Indonesia, so be it. Mm. I, I believe Tony's deadly serious. Mm -hmm. uh, can I add something to that then? I mean, in, in the light of that, um, the orders, I think he said that he's going to, the government is going to accept liability for this. Um, so the, the orders that are given to the naval officers or whatever to turn these boats back, um, in the question of, um, in the last, say, at least the Nuremberg trials, where that was no excuse for immorality. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you've anticipated what you will read in the book. Oh, okay, because I've, thank you. I've said in the book that the Nuremberg trials demonstrated that um, to say... I was operating under politicians' orders is no defence against uh, war crimes <coughs> charges. Now, of course, this only happens, crimes against humanity in this case, it's not a war. Mm -hmm. The crimes against humanity would only arise if people die during turnback operations, but quite a few people died during the turnback operations in 2001. So the likelihood of it happening again is very high. Mm -hmm. you, you had a case like, for example, a desperately <coughs> Um, distraught asylum seeker when he realised he'd been tricked into sailing back to Indonesia that the asylum seekers were locked in the hold and they were taken back to Indonesia and then they were brought out of the hold the next morning and said look that's Indonesia over there we've taken you back to where you came from. He was so distraught that he, he poured a can of petrol over himself and threatened to light a match and he was standing next to a group of Australian sailors. This is all captured on um, on Deb Whitmont's wonderful documentary for Four Corners to deter and deny, or to deter and repel. Um, those things happened, and curiously enough, the commander of that boat is now the, the Chief of Navy, Admiral Ray Griggs. Mm. So he has a very vivid recollection of all of that stuff. I, I can't predict what would happen when Tony Abbott gets in, or if he gets in, mm. things likely he will. I don't know whether he'll be able to be persuaded by the the Navy that um, this is not a good policy. I hope it's possible that he might be, but I have no security on, it, on that. Thank you. Isn't it his, uh, his approach is that part of it didn't have to come here? I'm sorry? His approach to uh, you know, say that he's not responsible or say, well, they didn't have to come here. They didn't have to make the trip. They are responsible. I am not responsible. In Tony has no time, isn't it? Yes, and that, that takes you right back to fundamentals, doesn't it? I mean, are we going to blame asylum seekers for making these journeys? Are we going to say, well, they should have worked out a way of staying where they were? Um, if you'd asked my mother that in 1938, 
she would have said, well, there was no way for me to stay in Austria after the Angelus. I would have been exterminated in a concentration camp the way most of my uncles and aunts were. I had to leave. Um, if Tony Abbott cast doubt on the, the reality of the need for asylum seekers to leave their homes, well, he's just not living in the same universe I'm living in. There, there are situations where people have to leave their country of birth. Unfortunately, there are those situations. They don't want to leave their country of birth. They don't choose to leave it. But sometimes they have to. Tony, can I ask, could the issue of the delay in response, I mean, Kay referred to that, and I guess we saw that in the recent the vote that sank recently, where the Amanda uh, Natalie O'Brien report on those votes, where there were very significant delays between the intelligence and then the response. I mean, could you could you say? I mean, is that in a sense? I guess one could one could speculate about that. Mm. You know that there's an intention but it could also be simply the bureaucratic system of work that you described. Could you say a bit about that yeah, issue, yeah, the I, delays in responses I try, and what that's about? I try never to speculate, Colin. Yeah. I, I, I've tried in this book to actually base everything I say in reported fact. I think there are two kinds of delay responses. One is a desire to protect sources of intelligence. If you're getting your information about a boat being in trouble from a secret intelligence source, you will not want to necessarily tell the Indonesian Search and Rescue Authority, hey, we've had a distress call, because you might be exposing your informants who are in a people smuggling network who are secretly feeding you intelligence. That seems to have possibly been a factor at work in the 2009 sinking. When the boat disappeared, we knew about it. We knew its coordinates for three and a half hours. We did. The Border Protection Command knew those coordinates, but it didn't tell the Maritime Safety Authority. The Maritime Safety Authority then told the Indonesian Maritime Safety Authority. By that time, the boat was sinking, and no, no lives were, were saved. But you get another kind of response too, another kind of delay, and that is just a deliberate, willful delay, which happens occasionally particularly more recently with all the pressure building up on, in the parliamentary debate on offshore processing when politicians of both major parties have found it very convenient to use deaths at sea as an argument for their preferred offshore processing solution. So both major parties are guilty of this. They say, oh look, hundreds of people are drowning. Countless, they love the word countless. Mm -hmm. It's like your poem that you have, um, approximate. Countless people are drowning at sea. We don't know when and how. Therefore, let's support the Malaysia solution or let's support the Nauru solution. I think that what really is happening very often is that um, we get information about a boat in distress and then we, we just try to bump it to the Indonesians. And so, the case of the boat that sank on the 21st of June this year was a classic case in point. We got our first distress call from that boat on the 19th of June, 48 hours before it sank. And that was when we said, go back to Indonesia, you're still only a few miles from the Indonesian coast. And we kept getting distress calls from that boat because it kept on limping its way very slowly towards Christmas Island, three knots an hour. And we got a number of distress calls over the next 48 hours. And in each case, we just batted them to Indonesian Search and Rescue Authority, Basanas, and said, here you are, we're assuming you will take responsibility for this because this is in your Search and Rescue Zone, which, as I said at the beginning of this talk, runs all the way to Christmas Island. And it's something we usually ignore when we go out and rescue boats, and never see boats. But in this particular case, for some reason, with the parliamentary debate building up in Canberra, we didn't. We didn't do anything except batter to Indonesia. And it was only when our aircraft overflying that distressed boat saw that it had capsized that we then finally launched a proper rescue response. As a result of which we were able to rescue roughly half the people on board. We rescued about 110 people but 90 people drowned. Now those 90 people undoubtedly would not have drowned 
if we had responded to the first distress call two days beforehand on the 19th of June. That's what Mr Pine calls sending out the water taxi. I call it saving life. We should have saved those 90 people. There are a lot of grieving families in Australia and abroad who are grieving those 90, 90 people. They need not have died. Yep. Yep. All these details are important historically to raise, um, if, well, if, a, if ever a case of prosecution is mounted. But I think we should remember, and it's not emphasized enough, why we have refugees. One, it's America's wars of intervention, occupation, colonization, plunder. Uh, the wars that we join in, we put our hands up saying, please, Mr. America, can we join your wars? Uh, also Britain, um, they're the criminals, uh, laying to waste countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, now we have Syria, uh, whatever your point of view about the people who were in charge of those countries, um, uh, it has, we have no right to interfere. So of course I think we need to emphasize again and again why people are fleeing their countries. You know, we are responsible. This country is also responsible for laying to waste the homelands of these people. And then to go back even further, the project for the American 21st century, this was laid out 19... 97 or 98, someone can uh, correct me on that. Um, this is the big design by America for control of resources, of markets. It's, uh, it's the, the great empire that did plans to plunder. Um, everyone thought that when Obama was elected, uh, a, a change, that he serves the same masters, he's the same kind of criminal who runs imperialist countries. So I think again and again we must emphasise why to the ordinary Australian people, why we have these refugees. You know, don't go in for the emotive bit about whether they have a right or they don't have a right. And as you quite rightly point out, the Jewish and other people who had to seek refuge. And Australia was another country where it, flat, it, it passed it on ships that came here with refugees from, uh, from Europe, Jewish refugees. It's not new. We've never been very humane. Well, thank yeah. you for your comment. Just any, we're just going to wind up soon. I'll just take maybe one more question. Anyone's got a question for Tony? Yeah, Natalie? Um, I just want to ask about the disruption program. Yeah. Um, in 2001 with the, with the civets and the AFP and the Indonesian police and whether that has morphed into something else or whether it's still in operation. Um, because well, the short answer is we don't know. I mean, we do know that disruption operations are continuing. We know that there's been a, a claim made by Brendan O'Connor, it's re reported in the book, that a great many voyages were prevented from happening because of disruption operations in Indonesia. A large amount of money was spent on it, a large amount of operatives were, were involved in that work. We haven't heard much about it in the last two or three years. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that disruption operations would mostly involve collecting intelligence on upcoming voyages and trying to prevent them. I hope that they don't involve actual acts of physical sabotage of boats, um, because that's extremely dangerous, obviously. So um, I can only say we don't know enough. So we'll, I think we'll wind up now. Um, the books are for sale. Uh, the bar will remain open. Tony is going to remain here for signing or, or questions. Um, and I'll finish there. Uh, I know many of you may come to events like this and feel, what do I do now? Uh, 
uh, one of the groups involved in organising the event tonight, the Refugee Rights Action Network. Uh, Victoria just wants to make a few comments. They've got a couple of events coming up, uh, and you may want to uh, make some contact with Victoria. Um, and uh, Victoria will just make a few comments. But listen, can I just conclude? Thank you very much for coming. Um, Tony, thanks very much for, for coming across and, and for publishing the book again, another important piece of work. Uh, one, one person I wanted to mention was, um, if you haven't seen the book, the cover uh, contains two very powerful images that Natalie Heyman, the artist of uh, Natalie, who had an exhibition back in 2010, no, 2000, 2009. Uh, Natalie did, um, was how many prints Natalie, was it? 33 paintings and three prints. 33 paintings and three prints of the Civex based on Tony's original book on the sinking of the Civex, which you may recall sank in 2001, Tony, 356 lives, mainly women and children. Um, and Natalie's artwork features on Tony's book. So, Natalie, thanks very much for. Yes, for Natalie, that. I meant to thank you. And thank you for coming. Sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll conclude there. There's sure a lot of people here you may want to introduce yourself to and have a chat to, and I'll just hand over to Victoria. But thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. I'm just going to say a few uh, a few quick words. I think after listening to presentations like this evening, uh, most of us, if you're anything like me, feel a bit of a combination of, of sadness, tremendous sadness, and anger. But both of those feelings are not very helpful when trying to make a difference and trying to make a change. What's needed, what we need to do is action. And I know and I understand not everyone can do what the folks at the Refugee Rights Action Network do. Get on a bus, travel out to the detention centers, and raise our voices, crying for the freedom, shouting for the freedom, demanding for the freedom of the refugees that we imprison, that we inter in remote camps without charge or trial. But that is certainly one of the things, one of many things, that the Refugee Rights Action Network does to try to impact the system of mandatory detention, to try to influence public opinion. And I encourage everyone here, if you're not the sort to get on a bus and join us. There are certainly many, many other types of action you can take. And one of the things you can help us do is uh, fund our trips. It's, uh, it's a bit dear to hire a bus and head out to these centers. But I do hope you will consider coming out with us on Sunday, August 26th, where we'll be making our first trip out to the Northern Detention Center and I think my friend Miranda down at the back of the room has sign-up sheets for coming out to Northam. But I'm going to pass around these, yeah, these flyers, if we can get those going. And that will direct you to our website. And the other thing you can do, if you want to get one of these groovy t-shirts, like the ones I, one I've got, we've got our t-shirts here for sale tonight. Special price, book launch price, $20 tonight. So I've got them in a range of sizes, and this again helps us fund the bus trip. That's all I had to say. Thank you very much.